Welcome to um, our Discovery Day. It's great to see so many of you here today. And I know we've got a number of people online as well. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce us to, us to this session. We've got three really interesting speakers lined up for us today. We've got Mick Peter, Gisela Martin and Ian Thompson. Um, and Mick is first up. And so Mick is talking to us today about pictures of sculptures, sculptures of pictures. Um, and Mick is a professor of fine art and illustration in our Duncan Jordanston School of Art and Design. Over to you, Mick. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, I'm going to talk to you about, well, what it says in the title of the, of the, the first slide. Um, but I'm going to kind of raise the tone to a very high intellectual level immediately and go to a picture by David Sutherland, the, the illustrator who drew the Bass Street Kids for many decades and probably an inspiration for me thinking about being an artist to begin with. So I'm somebody who um, teaches illustration in Duncan of Jordanston um, and in my research I'm interested in uh, the history of illustration and editorial illustration and cartoons in particular but especially where they connect with the idea of what sculptures do and what artists do. So the kind of things that uh, you might feel anxious about if you go into a gallery. So you go into a gallery and you think, what does it mean? And editorial illustrators can make pictures about those things and have fun with it. And I tend to follow them in doing a similar thing when I make sculptures of pictures. So here we've got teacher, and I guess because I'm a teacher, I'm kind of aspiring to the sartorial look of this guy eventually, hopefully. And he's coming in with the raw materials for making sculpture, solid marble in a wheelbarrow. It's probably pretty heavy. He's sweating heavily um, and he's bringing it into his kind of errant pupils. Um, the, the strip does have lots and lots happens in it and lots of disastrous things, but they're supposed to be making a, a sculpture of their headmaster. Um, which goes horribly wrong. But eventually they go to Stonehenge or Stonehenge as it's been renamed by David Sutherland. Um, and they're sort of unleashed with their newfound artistic abilities um, and they start chipping away. Uh, and the end result is uh, they kind of made their own likenesses in the stone. So it's this idea of what's Stonehenge for? What's it mean? They kind of interpret it and make it their own thing. Uh, they're trying to make the headmaster, so why don't they just make portraits of themselves? So the Bass Street kids in these great big stones. Um, in terms of editorial illustration, I'm always thinking about people like Peter Arno, um, things where editorial illustration does a job that I find very interesting in the sense that uh, illustration, generally speaking, has to communicate fairly complex stuff, even if it's a gag and it has to be quite legible and quite understandable. So you can see lots of things are happening in P Peter Arno's picture, and personally I find fascinating. And it talks very directly about the idea of not understanding sculpture. So you've got somebody who's turning up to the uh, kind of stereotypical sort of atelier of the artist, and he is wearing all the signifiers of an artist. He's got a beret and he's got a kind of work-like costume. Um, and this person is immediately committed a faux pas before he's even entered the atelier because he's hanging his hat on a sculpture. So this, the picture's telling us that immediately he doesn't understand what thing in the room is a sculpture. So again, it kind of talks to that thing of naming objects as artworks, and that's a long running gag. So he's hanging his hat on there and the, the sculpture is doing another thing that I found very interesting and I could do a whole other talk that would be much, much longer about things with holes in. Very interesting. If you think about modernist sculpture, tend to think about things like Hepworth or Henry Moore who make things with holes in and that becomes a cipher for a modernist sculpture. So again, illustrators can use those things so you, you know where you're located in art history, which is extremely handy. And um, so there's another hole. Um, and this is Fugas. He's the, the person that's famous for uh, Careless Talk Costs Lives, if you know those underground posters in London. Um, and they're passing uh, something that looks like it's on the South Bank, kind of looks like a Henry Moore, though the whole has been sort of exaggerated and enlarged. And the person saying, that reminds me, dear, did you remember the sandwiches? So it's this idea of making a gag about what you're supposed to feel when you look at a sculpture. So 
you're supposed to feel something quite sort of noble when you look at Henry Moore. You're not supposed to be thinking about sandwiches. So I think those are the kind of games that are extremely fascinating. It's almost like the things you're not allowed to do, illustrators can do. And um, here's another folk hero of mine, Nick Flynn. And um, another thing about navigating galleries is really fascinating. So I make exhibitions. And the problem with exhibitions is people have quite set behaviours in exhibitions. So come in and be very quiet and reverential um, and you don't want anything to go wrong. So stepping back into things is a big issue. Um, Nick Flynn is the person who fell over in the Fitzwilliam Museum and knocked over some King Dynasty vases. Um, here it says uh, is he claimed he tripped over his shoelace. I guess that's kind of legalese, isn't it, for whether or not he intended to do it. So this is my work here. So I tend to make things that look a bit like editorial cartoons and can be kind of read sequentially. So here's a person with an enormous camera trying to photograph a mug who's bumping into a, a vase. So you can see in an environment, you can kind of see what's unfolding. It's quite legible. The storytelling's in there. Uh, and then what happens is they're trying to repair everything in the second scene. So in effect, I'm trying to synthesize those sort of experiences of when you talk about um, what sculpture does and make it into sculpture from those kind of source materials. And um, here's some other works. Here's a, here's a vitrine that I was invited to make in, in Nottingham. And I thought, what will I put in the vitrine? And I thought, what would you do if it were a drawing? Often I start with drawing instead of making. So the idea of somebody sort of taking a bath in it sprung to mind. So something that's quite easy to do in drawing are quite like the difficulty of then having to go and do it and make it. So these often are life size. So this person's in a, in a vitrine, it appears to be filled with water and there's a bar of soap. Um, and this is it in the situation of an opening, which I think despite being a bit blurry is quite amusing when you see people going about the business of being serious about thinking about art and being in galleries and kind of, kind of ignoring it, which is sort of interesting, this sort of ludicrous scene. Um, here's something at Hospital Field in, in Arbroath, the Sculpture Commission from a few years back. Um, great place to visit if you haven't been there. Um, and I made a sequence of outdoor sculptures about my anxiety of making outdoor sculptures. What's going to happen to them? So I made scenes in which people are interacting with them, but it's not going quite right. So somebody's dutifully explaining the sculpture and the person with the stick is trying to poke it and prod it. Um, I'm going to show you two groupings now of slightly kind of longer sequences of work. And again, a conscious of a timer. I've got quite a good thing here that counts down on green and starts to go red and then I'll start to sweat. Um, this is in Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art in, in uh, Gateshead. And I thought, again, I tend to approach opportunities to make exhibitions by saying, what do I feel about the opportunity? And this one, I felt kind of raw terror and also the idea of you know, you've got a responsibility to talk to people that come into a gallery that's incredibly popular and incredibly well attended. And it wouldn't it be nice if they could understand what I was on about. So in this uh, sequence, it starts with an arts administrator talking to an artist in a, an office and begins to unfold from there. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to think about the journey of a sculpture, this idea of the all important kind of object and how we have to treat it carefully and carry things with white gloves and have people to sort of unpack it and install it. But to go behind the scenes and make an extended gag about what happens with that. So the arts administrator is going wandering off with a clipboard and then you see in the main space a sequence of rooms which are the same room repetitively um, which show this artist in his studio again trying to play with those tropes of what a studio looks like and trying to make one of those Henry Moore type objects. So in the first sequence, you see the people have come to collect his marvelous new sculpture um, and they've got the clipboard to prove it. Um, they begin to encounter problems with moving it because it's extremely heavy and it's unwieldy because it's kind of bulbous. Um, and then the, the art movers suggest that he might want to introduce a sort of modification to the sculpture to make it a bit easier to move. So he begins sets to work. Uh, and in the last one, he's introduced an extra hole. So it was that kind of gag from those kinds of cartoons that deal with those Henry Moore type things, which 
are, there's so many of them. They're so funny and so fascinating, so many different takes on it. But in this one, it's that idea that the sort of the, the kind of intention of the sculpture is binned for its kind of uh, practicalities. But on showing it, you no longer see that. So things have happened in the studio that you're not party to and you take all the intentions to be good intentions. Um, eventually, uh, you arrive in this kind of semi-derelict street scene, a gallery that's closed for installation. And then because I quite like, but going back to my Nick Flynn slide, sort of disastrous endings or things that we can connect with as sort of fallible people where things go wrong or not quite as we anticipated. So the gallery's closed, but you can kind of peep through the wall and haven't quite finished making the exhibition. So they're painting the walls, um, but the, the two hold sculpture is in evidence. Um, and that's it from above. So again, you can see that thing about how cartoons work and things live in boxes. I quite like to put things in boxes and there are many boxes. Um, and my last few slides are from a project that I completed at the end of last year in Alençon in, in Normandy, which was really interesting, which is in a drum shaped building. It's a former, um, it's an alloblé, which is a kind of um, corn exchange. Um, and I talked to the, to the uh, curator there about can I make uh, a sequence of sort of scenes about this kind of local collector, almost like what's the problem of collecting and owning artwork and the people who sell artwork? I always find these things sort of fascinating because often a lot of these interactions and the price of things is whatever you say it is. So in this scene, you can see this in effect roughly six scenes. You can see the, the, the collector is there and he's got a price list and the price list is my work and he looks very unhappy about the cost of the stuff um, and the gallerist is is on her phone and not paying him great attention but I wanted to make sculptures that look a bit like if you were doing an editorial about sculptures they're sort of ridiculous they're like almost kebabbed objects um, and in a way trying to sort of make them seem as silly as possible but again having to actually make them is quite an interesting process. Um, here's the gallerist in, in her kind of small Parisian, probably gallery in somewhere quite where the rent is low in Paris, slightly graffitied, unpacking the work and looking bemused. So I think that state of bemusement is what I want to inject into what I do quite often. So how do you feel initially? I feel confused. How do we unpack that? Let's make some work about it. Um, here he is again, you can see with his, he's got his art fair bag, he's got a rather fetching scarf, he's wearing the costume of a person that buys art. Um, this is also him, he's shutting up shop in a, a jewellery shop that seems to have run out of money, it's up for sale, so you can see the problem of the cost of things, which I think is interesting to comment on in the art world. Um, happens to be next to these dogs hanging outside a butcher's shop. And here's the collector in his apartment. He's kind of looking out of the, the window and, and wondering um, what's been happening, what he's just bought. He's got his collection of things that will happen to be the same colour. And so I think ultimately in those sorts, sorts of situations with the, the collector and so on, I, what I'm doing in the work is trying to synthesise those things that I mentioned at the beginning, those people like Fugas, even the Bass Street kids, that idea of what happens when you cross the threshold of a gallery space and you walk in and you think, OK, how do I unpack this, this codified experience? So in these works, and you probably see they all are in gallery spaces, I'm trying to find a, a, a kind of way that allows people to sort of feel differently about the work. And it's very interesting to watch people interact with that work because it uses a language of cartoons you can see that they automatically feel more relaxed and they feel more that they feel some sort of sense of recognition. It's recognisable stuff and an irrecognisable idiom. And then you can kind of introduce quite complex ideas. Um, so thanks very much. That's me. Thank you, Mick. That was really interesting. So we're going to go through each of the three speakers and then take questions together at the end. So store your questions for Mick and we will come to them. Um, I'm delighted to introduce next um, Gisela Martin, who's going to talk to us about accountants of the future. Um, Gisela is um, 
is works in our Masters in Professional Accountancy program in the School of Business and Economics. So over to you. So thanks again and welcome again. Um, so I would like to use the next 10, 15 minutes uh, to say thank you to everyone who is involved with this Masters in Professional Accountancy program and uh, thank them uh, for all the efforts they actually put into this program over the years. Um, the team, I think we start with the most important one and we start with the students and um, they are uh, the ones who nominated this program uh, and uh, uh, they are the ones who uh, felt that this program actually uh, needs appreciation uh, from uh, from the uh, student uh, body as well. Um, we are involved with these students, the teaching team um, within the accounting and finance discipline. We have a few of those colleagues around. We have um, Justin Hoff and Lee Roberts teaching talks um, and financial management. We have uh, Darren Job uh, and uh, Tondo Lolevi teaching auditing and assurance. Uh, we have Alison Fordyce teaching financial reporting, uh, Renzo Cordino teaching management accounting, and Ian is going to join the team uh, from this semester. We have Igor Kiselev uh, doing financial management with these uh, students uh, and we have the supervisors for the summer project. Uh, Paul is in the room who also supervises uh, these students. So we have the teaching team, uh, but uh, we also have uh, class representatives both for the January and September intake. These class representatives support the students on the program, but they not only support the students, but they support the teaching team as well. Um, and they are involved, uh, very involved uh, with the success uh, of the program. We have career services. Again, uh, we have dedicated uh, colleagues uh, for uh, the business school. We have Jill Moore who supports the success of this program. Uh, she is the TPG career advisor and involved uh, uh, with these students. Uh, I would like to say thank you the professional services all around the university, especially the, uh, the administrative support from the business school for TPG students. The English support, we have Deborah Hardin here. Thank you for the support uh, uh, that you provided over the years to these students. And Thank you for all of the professional bodies and the community, local and wider community to get engaged with the students and with the program. So what is it what we do with these students and how do we achieve this appreciation from the students? Um, you can see the business school's vision. We try to develop innovative and responsible leaders for sustainable future. In line with the business school's vision and mission statement, uh, we have three competency goals for this particular program. We do in, uh, develop knowledge and understanding of these students uh, on particular areas directly related to professional accountancy. You can see financial reporting, performance management, audit assurance, ethics, uh, financial management, um, and tax compliance and fiscal studies. Uh, we make sure that uh, these students have uh, a good ethical understanding uh, and social responsibility, awareness of environmental and social issues, uh, and uh, we try to develop their professional ethics as well. And obviously, critical thinking and other intellectual skills are also important for these graduate students. Uh, um, professional judgment and decision making and communication uh, are uh, included. So we do try to improve these employability skills and employability prospects of the students uh, and uh, we try to 
um, prepare these students for the ever-changing uh, business environment, uh, and we try to equip the students uh, with um, the different uh, functional business and professional uh, uh, competencies that is needed uh, when they actually start to work. Uh, or that uh, they go further uh, with uh, their professional studies. What we do is uh, innovative teaching. COVID-19 obviously pushed us all uh, to try to find new ways of teaching, new ways of assessment, and that's what we did. And even after COVID, we did try to keep most of those innovative elements. Uh, we use blended learning. We use, uh, although this program is fully on campus, we still use uh, pre-recorded videos or lecture videos. We use pre-recorded solutions to complex questions uh, and exam type questions. Uh, we use quizzes, progress tests, uh, which are supported by the university's, university's virtual learning environment. And it's not just the teaching uh, uh, which is innovative. We try to uh, give the students an opportunity um, to be assessed in, a, uh, in different ways. Although this program is accredited by the different professional bodies, and that means 50% of the, uh, the assessment has to be exam, and it has to be campus-based, invigilated, timed, closed book examination, the remaining 50% is up to us. So we give the students uh, an opportunity to challenge themselves. Uh, they have individual essays. They have a group projects with presentation. They have multiple choice class tests. Uh, and currently we are developing a new, uh, new role-based um, uh, assessment uh, for taxation and fiscal studies, uh, which will be based on a, a a case, a particular case uh, uh, based on tax evasion and, um, uh, and avoidance, and we try to further develop the students' ethical stance and moral stance uh, by this uh, role-based uh, new assignment. So we have this variety of assignments. I already mentioned the role of the class representatives. We have direct contract with these class representatives, not just through the uh, student and staff committee meetings, uh, which we have once or twice during a semester, but also we have regular meetings, two weekly meetings with the class representatives where we can actually change uh, ideas and they can report back what is going on and how we can actually develop uh, the teaching, uh, uh, the learning materials. Student feedback is very important and we do act on the student uh, feedback. For example, from this year we freed up a week, week six for the students, so they will not have uh, lectures and tutorials. They will have some time to catch up with the material during that particular week. Um, that was uh, one of their feedback that they need some time to brief. English support, I already mentioned Debra. We have the general business, uh, business English support, so the students have the opportunity to sign up for business English uh, during the first and second semester, but they also have individual support, uh, English support, especially related to uh, individual essays and the summer project. This individual support helps them to improve their academic writing references and everything that is needed uh, to polish that individual essay that they will eventually submit. Like I mentioned earlier, this program is an accredited program. It's accredited by five of the uh, professional bodies. Originally, it was only accredited by ACC Association of Chartered Certified Accountant, but over the years, the program gained recognition from Association of International Accountants, uh, uh, Chartered um, uh, uh, Management Accountants, uh, uh, ICAW, which is the English and Wales body, and from ICAS, which is the Scottish body. That's the latest one. So 
this kind of recognition of the program signals both to the applicants and the students and for the employers, the high quality of the program. These are internationally recognized the professional bodies uh, and the, those who will try to hire accountants will know these professional bodies quite well. Because the program is accredited by ACCA, we have a chance to provide this so-called ACCA advantage to the students. So the students will have an opportunity to sign up with ACCA and uh, under this advantage program, they will have uh, access uh, to career fairs, uh, uh, internship opportunities, uh, work opportunities. Uh, they will have individual support for uh, CV writing. Uh, so it's a wide range of sources that uh, ACCA makes available to these students. We do have agreements with these professional bodies and they do provide certificates, different certificates to these students for different achievements. For example, the students, uh, the best performing students on the summer project will have uh, an ACCS certificate for that uh, best written in individual project. And those certificates are given out during the prize giving ceremony. So all the family members and friends could see their achievement during that prize giving ceremony. We have very strong link uh, to professional bodies and that local business community. And, um, and that means we have guest lectures, we have workshops, uh, we have drop-in sessions, uh, uh, we have uh, all sorts of involvements uh, from these professional bodies and local communities. These guest lectures, uh, especially the ones uh, uh, given by the different local uh, local uh, companies, for example, Henderson Lobby, EQ Accountants, NCR, um, Johnston and Carmichael, uh, give the students an opportunity to get a better understanding on recent and relevant topics. It gives the student an opportunity to get a first hand insight into the practical application of the theories uh, that we actually look through uh, during the classes. The sessions with the professional bodies give the students an opportunity to ask questions from professionals whose in many cases are, for example, council members within these professional bodies. So they can ask uh, direct questions uh, from uh, uh, these uh, professionals uh, uh, who visit the university. The guest lectures are always related to the syllabus. So, for example, recently we had uh, classes on big data, data analytics and financial dashboards. Uh, we had uh, classes on cloud accounting, classes on charity accounting and how that's going to change or possibly changes. Uh, we had uh, guest lectures on ethics. Uh, so all those topics are directly related um, to the syllabus of these particular students. There is a built in business game into the syllabus. Uh, it's built in into the professional management accounting syllabus. Uh, um, chartered management accountants come to the campus and offer a business game to the students. It's a group uh, business game that students are presented the case and they need to solve the case, come up with suggestions and solutions. They have to present those suggestions and solutions and the winning team could get a certificate from uh, CIMA for, uh, for their achievements. We do have tailored career sessions. I mentioned at the beginning that we have um, uh, Jill Moore who works with the postgraduate students. These tailored career sessions are built into the, uh, the program. These are scheduled for the students, compulsory for the students. The students have sessions on CV writing, interview techniques, networking, and they do have two specific sessions directly related to graded as, uh, assignments. They have a session on presentation techniques and they have another session on communication in professional techniques, a con professional, uh, professional context. And uh, these photos were actually taken during that last uh, uh, session. And you can see Sam, 
who is one of our undergraduates uh, um, from the uh, Bachelor of Accountancy, um, uh, doing the workshop with Jill. And that means, again, we have one of the local businesses involved with this program. Sam currently works for EQ Accountants. Sage certificate, uh, I'm conscious about the time. The students, again, as a sort of uh, graded assignment, have a chance to work through an online course. And uh, once they work through the online course, they could take a test and they could uh, get an official state certificate and they can see how transactions and events are actually treated in accounting information systems and reported in accounting information systems. And you can see obviously it goes up to LinkedIn and all sorts of social media because they will have a digital badge as well. We also provide the uh, students uh, a chance to uh, be uh, always updated and uh, we always inform them about all sorts of events and webinars they can attend, magazines uh, published by the different professional bodies, opportunities for jobs and internships, uh, and um, uh, it is uh, highly appreciated by the students. So I think that's me and then I'm in the red. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gisela. Um, and again, audience, just keep your questions and we will come to them after the next speaker. So I'd like to introduce now Professor Ian Thompson, who is Chair of Accounting and Sustainability mm -hmm. in the School of Business. And he is going to talk to us about net zero accounting for a net zero world. Over to you. Imagine for a moment that a football game is decided on the number of passes that a team makes or how loud the crowd shouts. Imagine the Nobel Prize for Science is decided by TikTok likes or the winner of Bake Off is based on the amount of sugar that's in a recipe. Now that seems like madness, doesn't it? Or at the very least it's going to, with those types of ways of measuring things, distort the practices, distort what actually goes on, at least then kind of like deviate things away from the original purpose of a game of football, of a Nobel Prize for Science, or a nice cake. Right? But, how we measure things really matters. How we decide winners from losers, how we decide good from bad, very good from kind of like excellent, and we make these discriminations. And underpinning this is what, how we measure things, which is often overlooked. We often don't actually kind of like scratch the surface of some of the data that's actually used to actually do things. And when we're trying to measure things that matter the most, measurement matters more. We need to get that measurement right. But surely, surely something as important as climate change, we don't have an issue there. We don't have, you know, how loud. By the way, it's Borussia Dortmund of the loudest team. Everyone thinks Galatasaray, but there we go. Some interesting research. When it comes to something like climate change, which is arguably difficult to think of something which matters more to people on this world, it's it's kind of like it's, a, it's an existential threat to what's actually going on. It matters more to more people, to more different uh, and, and more different kind of like aspects of, of what's actually going on. And climate change is something that we actually know what causes it. It's green, increasing greenhouse gas emissions. It's the atmospheric kind of um, concentration of different gases in the atmosphere. With beyond reasonable doubt that we know these different things. And climate change is causing many, many different things. Unlivable cities, starvation, species extinction, water insecurity, water stress. Whole industries are actually kind of like being wiped out. Communities are being sort of like dislocated from there. We have the, the bizarre paradox in places like Australia where we have flooding and fires happening at the same time. Right? 
It's one of the biggest threats that we've actually got. It's also one of the things that we also have some of the most reliable and consensus amount of scientific evidence on what's actually causing it. We know what's causing it. We know how to solve it. We know how to measure greenhouse gas emissions, and yet we're not actually doing enough about it. And actually, when we come to look at the, the evidence base, and this is one of the, the things that's come, come with kind of my research over this, this time, is that what we have is underpinning this is forms of accounting that actually don't reflect the reality of what's actually going on. It doesn't provide the information and the evidence that decision makers, and that can be business leaders, that can be politicians, that can be individual consumers, that actually provide the evidence that they can look at and choose the right option. In fact, I would argue that what we have, and I'll, hopefully I'll demonstrate some of the, you know, kind of the, the reasons behind that, is what we actually have is forms of carbon accounting that actually tell lies, that actually distort decision making. And then when people look at it, even well-intentioned individuals and well-intentioned organizations trying to do the right thing based on the evidence in front of them, pick the wrong things that make things worse. Let's imagine, let's imagine we're a government in the United Kingdom. Let's imagine we're the thought, isn't it about time that we had opened another deep coal mine? Right. We don't imagine we're kind of considering that sort of thing. Even though we know for facts of facts, there are social scientists in here and stuff like that, but we you know, pretty much know that if we burn all of the known fossil fuel reserves, we will exceed the global carbon budget to keep to one and a half degree warming not by 10%, 20%, but a factor of seven. Now that's a good margin forever where you actually sort of like go. We also know that the only real way to actually to achieve the 1.5 is to move to net zero as quick as possible, okay? Oh, and by the way, there is no shortage of fossil fuels anyway. There's plenty there that we actually need. Maybe it's not in the right place for OK, so we, we have this 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 thing that we're actually kind of moving on. We need to move to, to net zero. Remembering that last year, as the results have just come out, it was the hottest year ever on record and the last in a, in a worrying trend. So we really do have a kind of a, a problem that we've actually there. Net zero quite simply means no more um, kind of uh, carbon dioxide or other greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere without taking out. So we have a, a, a flux where we can ab absorb carbon through nature-based systems and, and different things like that. So if we're going to kind of like to, to look at this, how can we take this net zero claim? So this is a big thing that's actually happening in businesses. And we're all aware, I'm an accountant, there's other accounts in the audience, we know the magic that financial accountants can do. An asset, into a liability, a loss into a profit, a profit into a loss, a liability into income. Is it possible that carbon accounting can do the same magic and make emissions disappear and make it seem like what we've got is we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions at the same time that we're actually making things worse? I mean, did you know that every company in the UK, every large business has to produce its annual greenhouse gas emissions as far as annual reports? Yes, good. Do you think that this information is any use for decision makers? Let's explore this in a little bit. Let's take this, 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 um, this example, this coal mine. And here we have a kind of a graphic that kind of represents most of the greenhouse gas emissions from the inputs that come into it there, things that they buy, things that they use, and what we call embedded emissions. We have the energy that they use, we have the activities, and then we have the future carbon as a consequence of the kind of like the product. So you make something, you sell it, other people use it. <clears throat> so based on this and the UK government current 
and way of properly accounting for greenhouse gas, properly accounting for greenhouse gas emissions. And it's the same as virtually every other uh, national reports and most um, sort of like stock exchanges listing other than the EU who like forget all this. They, they include all these emissions. Another wonderful Brexit, Brexit kind of dividend. Let's see, right, what are included to net off to zero? Well, we'll get rid of all the products because obviously that's got nothing to do with the company. So when we're looking at the net zero to net off what emissions we've got to balance down, we'll get rid of all of our products. Oh, and we might as well get rid of all the inputs as well. And while we're at it, well, let's get rid of waste, employee commuting and business travel. And this is what we now call is the annual emissions of a company that we have to net off to zero. OK, if we put this in some form of context in the coal mining sector, that equates to a third of the emissions. So by magic, fully complying with kind of government regulations and listing requirements, we can actually get rid of two thirds of the emission. And then we can then net off and plant a few trees or pretend do some other 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 kind of things that actually go on and claim that this coal mine is net zero. Net zero while still putting double the amount of carbon into the atmosphere, which isn't net zero. Yet anybody looking at the accounts of this could believe that it's actually there. And if we just maybe look at some, <laughs> just put some kind of numbers on this, let's just look at the coal for one year of this one mine, just the use of it. The planned output's about 2.8 million tonnes. That produces 8.8 .8 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. That always screws my head, actually. So, when, you know, kind of like when you burn stuff, you think it gets more, it gets less, it gets more. This coal is virtually pure carbon. So you multiply it by about three. Those you, sorry, apologies to chemists and physicists there, but I'm an accountant. How many, if we take that emissions, how many times around the world would you think you would be driving to kind of commensurate that? Would it surprise you to think it's 1.3 million times around the equator? Right, from one year output from this, this net zero. This is stuff which is not included in the net zero calculation. Um, and if we want, it's actually 540 million commuter journeys between Edinburgh and Dundee, or over a billion train journeys a year between something there. Coal sector's not alone. There we go. Other sectors here. In fact, the coal sector is not too bad because they actually dig stuff and do things. Things like the financial sector, 98% of their emissions are not included. IT is a similar percentage. So we've got a massive problem of non-accounting for emissions that actually kind of like go in there. So there's a real need to develop proper carbon accounting that tells the consequential climate truth of what's actually going on. So when we look at a number, that's what we should judge it against. And that's very much the work that we are actually kind of like trying to do in this field, in this net zero accounting. And we want to move towards what kind of Mark Carney, the ex-governor of Bank England in Canada, says that every time we produce a financial number, we should have a carbon number alongside it. And then maybe we can start making better decisions on what's actually going on. One of the problems we have is that greenhouse gas emissions are invisible. That's one of the problems. They are invisible. It's really difficult. We can't see them. We can't see. We can't smell. Oh, I've emitted carbon. You're all emitting carbon, right? We can't see it. So therefore, we need technique, we need technologies, we need accounts to make it make the invisible visible, to make it measurable, to make it then manageable, so we can then input it into, into decisions. Now, we do have tech tech technologies that actually allow it. The little picture there is that we have cameras that can actually see greenhouse gas emissions, can see carbon dioxide, can see it. We've got space satellites that can identify methane em emissions and stuff like that. But what we need to do is we need to try and find ways in which we can actually make this accessible. Imagine a superpower that we could look at something and we could see the past emissions, the current emissions and the future emissions of different use cases and different scenarios.
Because that's where we really need to start to make the kind of decisions if we're actually going to we're going to actually to do that. We need to find ways that we can do this simply and also in a way that can be assimilated into decision making process using ideas from choice architecture, the latest developments in digital science, the different ways in behavioral science and how we can actually turn this into this in this new visibility into something that's actually kind of meaningful. So when we look at something like a car, when we're looking at something like a like like a car, we want to look at it and we want to be able to see, imagine the kind of the whole life cycle carbon consequences of this, the inputs, the operations, and then the kind of activities and the purpose. So that this provides us a baseline. This isn't this creating accounts doesn't actually solve anything. It's the decisions that come out about as a consequence of this. So we can actually look at this as a kind of a baseline and start to see where the opportunities are for us to kind of like to intervene by providing this kind of this life cycle and um, sort of like greenhouse gas emissions, we can then start to look at things and then we can look at ways in which we can actually intervene. So if we use waste activities rather than virgin kind of activities, we can then reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of the life cycle of the of this of this present. What we call the circular economy dividend. We look at fuel efficiency. We can look at smarter energy technology. We can look at the purpose of the journeys. Why are we journeying? Like one of the easiest ways to minimise minimise kind of like uh, unnecessary journeys as we're kind of like going on. And maybe it's about rethinking the idea of car ownership to low carbon social mobility, which is again a very different kind of like concept. But we also need to build up carbon literacy because there's no point providing evidence to people who don't know how to use it. So what we need to do is we need to provide also create this kind of carbon literacy within decision makers who can ask the right question, who can challenge some of these assumptions and make sure that at every point on this, we can systematically identify the lowest carbon kind of like emissions that are actually there. And that's really what we mean when we're trying to look at look, look at stuff sort of like green net zero accounting for a net zero world. And that's why, if you like, in terms of the <clears throat> the work that we're we're doing within the Department of Accounting, within other other kind of like things, is actually to develop, use the best practice from accounting, to and apply this to the kind of the problem of kind of 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 climate change, so we can create accounts that actually prepare this. And and on a more specific level, there's three strands of I think to the work that's actually going on. Strand one is making sure that everybody knows that the way we currently do it is a crock off is not appropriate or fit for purpose. Right? We need people to do that because most people do not know that. And why would they? They're not experts, they're not geeks, they've not studied this for 30 years. The other thing is to develop new greenhouse gas accounting techniques that measure what we treasure. And for me, we tre I treasure the earth. Okay and life, all the life that's on it. And we need to innovate and develop new techniques, new methods, new protocols and new, new things there. And then we also need to kind of like greatly enhance climate literacy and disseminate best practice carbon accounting throughout the world. Personally, I gave myself a goal about five years ago after being on a Fridays for the Future mark. And that is, as an accounting academic, I want to ensure that every single undergraduate doing accounting and finance is exposed to climate, climate and climate finance and climate accounting in there so that we can actually start to kind of do that. And there's more more to it in there. But what we kind of find is that if we don't have this evidence, we can't make the right decisions. We can't make the policies. Individuals will actually kind of like make mistakes. That's why I would argue that accounting can help save the world. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. That was fascinating. Um, OK, so we've got some time for questions now. I've asked the three speakers to come to the front of the stage. Um, we um, 
John is going to capture any questions from online, but I'm going to turn to questions from in the room first. So do we have any questions for any of our speakers? Yep. I was fascinated with what you were saying there about net zero accounting, uh, Ian, and I was going to ask, I, I, follow, I absolutely agree that accountants to be the students in training should certainly be exposed to uh, the net zero world, let us say. How many other universities are doing this? Do you know? Um, we we took us we did a survey um, about two years just before Glasgow COP twenty three years ago now goodness, um, and we identified that over a hundred and fifty universities around the world are doing some some climate uh, climate change. It may not be obvious, but my previous job I just joined um, from Birmingham so. Um, uh, from Birmingham University, where we were the first university to mainstream climate accounting in all of our courses um, in, in accounting and finance. So every every kind of like um, did that. We've been working with the there's a, a research research network, Centre for Social Environmental Accounting, has about 900 active kind of um, environmental accounting researchers. And again, we're working with that with that kind of uh, org organization to to move things through. Um, it's it's uh, it, it's happening. It's often secret. <laughs> you smuggle it, smuggle it in here and there. But there is in in Britain. I, it's I mean, I think I'm looking looking to call here. I, I'd say we'd be about 25 percent. There are some really good examples, you know. So, for example, there's there's um, Imperial College and Edinburgh University have dedicated um, master's programs on it. Um, we're kind of like working with University of Tasmania who want to to include different things in the, in their programs. So. Professional accounting bodies are, are looking to include this as well, so I'm working with them to to include it. So it's 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 not enough. It's starting. It's starting decades too late, but there does seem to be an interest and momentum developing around it. So. Thank you, um, and down the front here. Thanks uh, again to Ian and Gazella. It's really the role of the professional bodies and to what extent there's momentum building behind uh, accounting for net zero now, both uh, professional bodies in terms of the research yeah. you're doing with them, Ian, and also Gazella in terms of the students you're helping to graduate. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I mean, I think we all of the professional accounting bodies that Gazella kind of like put up um are actually have initiatives underway um working also with the financial reporting council sorry if this is getting a bit nerdy to not accountants but financial reporting council are the are the regulatory bodies of of, of accountancy so they they tell them what they have to do so we're also working with working with the financial reporting council to actually disseminate it all all the way through um, it is already included in some of the syllabus, and I, and I and I know maybe Gisela can can mention that there's quite a lot of change going on in this space as well. Yeah, uh, all of the professional bodies, as uh, Ian mentioned, uh, did uh, started to introduce started to introduce uh, um, environmental uh, and social awareness related uh, topics and uh, reporting um, uh, that uh, we also need to include the syllabus. So, for for example, the program I was talking about, professional management, uh, professional accountancy. Um, in every single taught module, we actually have some elements of environmental and social accounting. For example, in financial reporting, we talk about uh, the reporting part. Um, Ian has the management accounting, and that will involve some uh, environmental accounting um, and some non-performance, uh, uh, non-financial performance measures as well. In finance, financial management, we have green finance included in the syllabus. Uh, in auditing, uh, we have corporate governance, and we also have assurance of environmental and social um, reporting. So uh, we. We do try to include elements 
uh, into the syllabus, but it takes some time. And unfortunately, these professional bodies do not cut other areas from the syllabus. So we will need to cover what we have today and the additional uh, elements as well. Um, so it's a sort of balancing of. Yeah, I'll just say one thing. University of Dundee plays a critical part in the development of social environmental accounting. Professor Rob Gray, I think in 1990, formed the Centre for Social Environmental Accounting. This was, <laughs> Dundee was the first university, I think almost in the world, to introduce this as a topic at a time when everyone thought Rob and myself were mad. And now it's actually sort of coming through. So there's a long tradition if you like, the origins of this, all of this lie in this very institution. Right. Um, question down here. There's a question for Mick. Hi, Mick. Um, <laughs> Mick, you're working across illustration, sculpture um, and narrative. And I just wonder if you could unpack process a little bit, your process, like where the ideas come from, how they come and how you develop them. Sure. Um, I think for me, I tend to approach all the any situation sort of in terms of how I might feel about it as a practitioner, but also how you might feel as somebody who's going to see it and kind of, you know, those feelings that aren't necessarily to do with, um, you know, the, the sort of more kind of headline generic things about a space or an exhibition space. So, you know, how do you feel about this kind of scenario that you're in how do you feel about the room or the size of the room how do you feel that people might um encounter work in that space because you're not the only person to do something in these situations quite often so how's that encounter going to feel for for people coming to a space so i tend to try and unpack that first i'll also do quite a lot of observational drawing and kind of sounding out so i guess that's a real illustrator's practice that you always you kind of keep your hand in by looking and recording and, and often it's a bit of a portmanteau thing. It's kind of assembling visual gags from different sources and making sense of them in a narrative, as, as you describe. So I think that's that's probably my response. I've always got one eye on the audience and one eye on kind of legibility, which again, I suppose, is something that comes from an illustration or sort of design scenario that you're kind of you're wanting it to be understood at least on some levels and it might be sort of unpackable beyond that and it might have more rhetorical kind of art world gags in it but the kind of top line stuff should be really clear and kind of engaging i think that sort of disarming thing is probably what to what i want to do first so there's a few there's a few different things happen probably i'm drawing on something that i'm doing all the time and um, i'm Kind of thinking about my feeling about it and somebody else's feeling about it and trying to pull that in um and then i'm also trying to have fun or make it feel like it's fun i guess thank you um so a number of questions here um i think we'll go to the lady in the far left first um and then coming to you i have a question for mick um so i would say that Normally, a cartoon is an ephemeral object. We get it very quickly and we rarely look after them. And sculpture we see as something that's just going to be around for a very long time. How do you preserve and do you preserve the, uh, are the installations or are they, are they something that actually is there for, for, for the long term? And what were your intentions for it? Or, or do you? just preserve the installation as it happens and, and record that information. I think I tend to make the thing so particular to where it is that its component parts might live on, but a lot of it's like kind of scene making in the sense it's almost like set building. So the scenario it's like how you kind of control the environment and the framing of it. It's a bit like the boxes that are described in in Baltic. It's a way of some the, the temporary components are very much like a visual framing of it, but is kind of made in a temporary way. I'm quite in, you know, in, in terms of, you know, if we're thinking about carbon and things like that, I'm, I'm trying to make things where you're not storing tons of things and you're not using processes that are actually, you know, because if I'm always got a kind of sense of the irony of the position that you're in. So 
it's on for a certain amount of time is it really sensible to make it all out of concrete and you know so a lot of the things quote things from tv production or set building that the temporary nature of it is built into it so a lot of those things are big drawings scaled up and made into kind of things that encapsul encapsulate a narrative or experience but break down into generic stuff and can be spirited away or sort of reused so bits live on and kind of are made in a slightly more thorough way or have to really purport to be the thing that they look like they are but a lot of it is taking something that's one tenth of the size puffing it up and, and sort of designing it like that so it does have that kind of a, a sense of how it falls apart afterwards it's like you know see a great cartoon in the magazine you're going to recycle the magazine probably it's that sort of sense is probably in it as well thank you and yeah question sir Thank you, uh, Ian. I'm just wondering, is there an international agreement how net zero accounting is measured? And if you could just very, very quickly, just very simply explain, how do you actually measure uh, carbon emissions in monetary terms? I mean, because I think they have to be believable and accepted as, as real figures to be, you know, to, 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 be, to, be, to be noticed. So just wondering how, how if it's an international agreement, how do you actually measure it? You don't mind me asking. Okay. Um, First of all, there is no net zero means nothing. Right? Effectively, it, it's one of these empty, empty kind of signifiers. Um, and it's kind of it has no no defined no defined meaning. Um, that's how you can that's how oil companies can claim to be net zero, um, even though they're, they're responsible for about a third of all global kind of like emissions because they don't have to take it into account. Now there are different competing voluntary standards on how you calculate it and what uh, unfortunately what we have now is we have a a series of competing definitions of net zero um which which are there from often there's a there's a there's a un greenhouse greenhouse gas protocol which underpins the the life cycle so the, there is a well established um kind of like methodology that, that actually has been around for I'd say about 30 years and hasn't and, and has continued to adapt. The problem is, is the political kind of like bit where they select certain elements from it and, and it's there. So it's very much a kind of a choice. Which bits do you actually you actually kind of pick? <clears throat> I would say that the. My approach is not to value financially carbon. I think what you do is you have the financial numbers and alongside it you then have the carbon carbon consequences it's like stating the transaction in a different currency so typically what you do is you there's massive databases of different components different uh, products that actually people have actually done the the life cycle assessment there's you know environmental scientists as a whole there's huge databases of these different things so typically what you would do is you would go right we're using concrete we know that concrete has you know that we go to the concrete kind of like the concrete file it tells us the embedded emissions energy emissions how long it would take to trans translate so so it's very much it's a, it's a very kind of mechanistic type process. All the kind of like the data is there um, and it's just assemble and assemble it together. There is a real, I think there's a real danger in trying to value carbon financially. That's fraught with difficulty. It's really fraught with difficulty because as soon as you put a price on something, it means as long as you pay more than that, then you can screw things up. It's like, you know, it, it's very difficult to get that kind of that, that financial commensuration, which is which is kind of problematic. And um, you can value certain things. You know, we, we can value things in a you know an electric car versus a diesel car. We can value the you know, we can include in the value of the car how much we'd actually want to pay for that in relation to its climate impact. But that's a that's a slightly different different type different type of process. Thank you. Um, I've got a uh, a question from online um, and it's for you, Ian. Um, firstly, the person wants to thank you all for your presentations. Um, and then the question is, 
um, really, how does the UK's legislation compare to other countries? And really, what the question is, is are there other countries that we could learn from and that we might take example from? European Union, there we go. The European Union have, <laughs> um, there's countries we we don't want to take a, take a, a, a lead on, and I'll not list them, but the EU um, has some of the most comprehensive and rigorous um, carbon accounting, carbon accounting standards. So in that diagram that I showed you of all of the different components, if that was a European mine, they would have to disclose all of those carbon emissions as part of the things to, to net off. Um, if you're in the UK and you know sort of like America and other countries, you've only got what's what's referred to as the di the, the direct emissions, what we call scope one and two. So the EU is um, is there, and it's setting up. They're setting up to be kind of a fight in carbon accounting between the comprehensive full life cycle consequential model that's actually done by the in the EU or the partial attributional model, which is in the in the kind of the rest of the world. And you you'll not be surprised to know that it's whilst it's um, something there's massive amounts of vested interest and behind the scene fighting going on to control what, what's what's actually there. So watch the watch the space. But, um, Brilliant, thank you. Um, OK, so I'd like to thank all of our, our presenters for such interesting talks today and all of you for your questions, which have generated some some more really interesting discussion. I'd like to invite you all to stay for a cup of coffee. We have coffee and refreshments outside and then indeed to stay for the next session, um, which starts at um, quarter past three. Um, and um, I'm I'm asked to um, ask you to find the feedback forms on your seats and to complete them and to leave them in situ before you leave and they can be collected and it will help us understand how we can make these discovery sessions even better in years to come. But thank you for your participation.